Well, it's been said that you're either going into a trial, you're coming out of a trial, or you're in the middle of a trial. Basically, what that means is we're all dealing with something. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about how Christians should respond to trials. And to discuss this, I'm joined by Ben Cordes. He's the pastor of Lexington Primitive Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, Ben, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me, uh, Brother Josh. I appreciate the opportunity to speak and um, hoping that what what we say today will be glorifying unto God and um, hopefully uh, will be a benefit to God's people. And um, I just appreciate it that you're allowing me to come on and talk. Uh, we, we're glad you're here. My first question for you you know, one of your greatest qualities, and Ben has a lot of good qualities, but one of his greatest qualities, he's an Alabama fan. So as an Alabama fan and somebody <laughs> who grew up in a state obsessed with football, I wanted to ask, what has been the trans- transition to a state obsessed with basketball? Uh, well, it, it's definitely been a change because, uh, as you know, being raised in um, a state that adores football, to say the least, um, basketball not being all that important. Um, it's, it's been funny to, to see people's obsession here with, uh, a ball that's not shaped, you know, like an egg. Um, <laughs> but you know, to hear people, uh, obsess over basketball is just a strange thing to me, but getting used to it, it's, it's fun though. I don't feel like I have to sacrifice any allegiance or anything like that because the, the sports are completely different up here. And I could feel like I could, you know, of course, still be a Bama fan, but uh, can also be excited about the Kentucky Wildcats as well in their basketball season. Though this year has been a terrible season for them, terrible. So, this year so but, far uh, has been, a, you know, I guess when this podcast airs, we'll know more about what happened in basketball. But Alabama's been pretty good this year, so that's right, they have, and that's been a very strange uh, thing to see. <laughs> as well. So. <laughs> well, uh, when we're thinking about dealing with trials and how we should respond to trials in our lives, uh, you know, I'm going to turn it over to you. Where, where should we start when we're thinking about this? Well, and uh, I appreciate that because uh, the, the things that uh, you said earlier about going through trials and uh, whether we're in one or headed toward one or just now leaving one, um, I, I think that we have to consider what trials accomplish and how, you know, our Lord, our God is always in control and knows exactly what he's doing or either what he's suffering us to go through. Um, and we, we have to be clear about what trials are and that, you know, our, our God tells us that he doesn't tempt us with sin. Um, and, but yet, we do know that there are tr- the trying of our faith that we have that sometimes the Lord does lead us to those things. Um, you know, we, we do have to remember um, that whenever the Lord Jesus was uh, going into the wilderness uh, to be tempted of the devil, the Bible tells us that he was led of the spirit uh, to be tempted. Um, so, and then we recall what the Lord tells us to pray for whenever we uh, read the Lord's prayer to his disciples, he says in that prayer, uh, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, Sometimes it is the Lord's uh, desire for us to be led to a, to a trying of our faith. And uh, we have to consider our sovereign God and his purposes and why he does that. And uh, James tells us that the trying of your faith work at patience and, uh, and that we ought to be uh, desirous of a, a more perfect version of ourself. And what I mean by that is a more mature version of ourself in Christ. To be a Christian, um, we should never be satisfied with where we currently stand in terms of our walk with the Lord Jesus, in terms of our discipleship. Uh, but we should desire to grow in that discipleship, grow in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and to grow in our faith um, so that we might allow for that light that's supposed to shine for the glory of God, uh, allowing it to shine brighter. And I, I think the 
one of the greatest, most effective ways that that happens, of course, is through the trials that we face and our desire to uh, persevere in those circumstances and to do uh, our very best to honor God and to keep a godly attitude and behavior about us. And so I think the first place that we have to look when we are being faced with hardship or trials or whatever you want to call it, is we have to look to the person of Jesus Christ and how he handled uh, circumstances that were uh, around him and that he was faced with, of course. Uh, We know that Jesus handled all things perfectly because he is the perfect, sinless Son of God. Um, nevertheless, uh, he, he tells us that uh, he was in all points tempted just like we are, yet without sin, and that he is uh, affected uh, with the feeling of our infirmities. He is touched by those things that we go through because he himself has experienced them as well. And I've always thought, you know, if you're going to do something and you're an endeavoring to, to try something new or uh, you wanting to improve yourself, you go to someone who's uh, championed that. And, you know, you wouldn't want to go to someone who, who lost out or um, who, who failed miserably to find out how to do things. You want to go to the person who's done the best at it. And, and certainly Jesus Christ overcame everything. Um, and to, to the glory of his Father, uh, we look to the perfect one, Jesus Christ, to see how we ought to behave in a, in a cruel and sinful world and with uh, the adversary who's walking about seeking whom he may devour, we want to see what Jesus did to respond to those things. And so we look to his person for that. That's a great point. I, I've, I've tried to stress many times in my little ministry that, uh, you know, you don't, so many times we run to our friends and, and maybe people our same age or whatever, but go to people that have been through it before. And here we have this example of Jesus who was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. He made it through where we usually don't. Yes, and and when we look to Christ, we see, um, you know, his character, his attitude. And, uh, you know, being tempted himself, uh, once again, not not with sin. He never never was enticed by sin in any way, though it is awfully appealing to our flesh at times. we, we still see how that the character that he possessed, he put within us as well. And uh, his meekness, his humility, his patience, uh, kindness and the charity that he has, his gracious, and even his justice, you know. Uh, we, we think about how Christ will, you know, is, is pictured as being all loving and all charitable. And of course, he absolutely is, but we, we forget the justice side of things as well and, and his righteous indignation that he had for uh, against sin and the wicked things that we're doing. When we, we think about him cleansing the, ta- uh, the temple twice. And, um, and But what was he doing that for? Was he doing it for his own self-promotion? Was he doing it um, because it, you know, was, it, it appealed to some thing in his nature that was, uh, that, that was prideful? No, it was for the glory of his Father. And so when we consider how our behavior ought to be, it's for the goal and for the purpose of glorifying our Father. And so we see it in in God himself as well. The Father, while he uh, dealt with the children of Israel in the wilderness in the Old Testament, when Moses even um, appealed to to God's grace and standing up, um, you know, in in favor of, of course, God, but also in favor of a Healing to God for and on behalf of the children of Israel, and God would have been just to have consumed Israel, you know, to just destroy them. But Moses acted like uh, a type of Christ in standing in between Israel and God, and appealing to God's grace, and of course God having that grace on uh, the children of Israel. So we see where God's attitude has been demonstrated like that in the past, and and it's within us, but by the, by the grace of Jesus Christ, to be able to do the very same thing. You know, when we're born again, the Apostle Paul tells us that uh, as new creatures, all things are made new to us. 
how we view the world, how we view our circumstances, how we view trials and hardships. Uh, these things are made new to us, whereas before we would have thought, well, this this place is just out to get me, you know, and, and maybe even God's out to make my life miserable. Um, but as new creatures, we view everything differently, even uh, hardships and what they may be working within us for the purpose of glorifying God. Um, all things are made new into us. And that, that really does, uh, you know, kind of tell, uh, kind of causes us to tilt our head a little bit and maybe even scratch a little bit thinking, you know, everything new, but really, truly, all things are made new. Even our relationships with one another are made new um, in the new creation. And uh, what a blessed way to really look at things, you know, especially in light of this past year with all the, the trials that we went through and, and still, you know, still are going through today, um, not knowing when this, uh, you know, the virus uh, that we, we've been faced with is, is going to be over and not knowing when the restrictions maybe that we're living with are going to end, where we can embrace one another as we did before. Um, it, we, we have to think, you know, is this crisis that we're under right now, is it, is there a purpose that the Lord may have in us going through this? And and I think the answer is yes. It's always an opportunity for us to grow in our walk with God and our faith with the Lord and strengthening of that faith and that patience. Uh, we need to see this as an opportunity for us to grow. And uh, I know Winston Churchill, I think, was attributed with saying, never let a good crisis uh, go to waste. Um, and, and certainly people could take that in a bad way. Um, but I, I see some good thoughts in that as well. You know, we don't want to let something like this go without us growing and learning from it. And instead of turning to the beggarly elements of this world for help, it's like we said earlier, you know, to turn to the one who has championed all temptations, championed this world and seek to him. Uh, for help and and see how it is that we can grow with, in our faith with the Lord. You know, I've heard the saying before: "Let your let your mess become your message." And and the point of that is that you know we all have a past, right? Every 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 saint was once a sinner, um, and and we still struggle with those things, and we go into temptations, and we and and maybe we've dealt with other things, and so you know there is a. I like that, that you can make your, your mess, your message, how God delivered you from that. But I think what I also hear you saying is that there is, there's a message through some of the mess that we deal with. And so the attitude we go into uh, the trials with has a lot to do with how we come out of those trials. I believe you, you, you quoted from James earlier, which is it counted all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. So that's certainly, you're talking about being all things new. That's, that's an attitude that is contrary to, uh, to human nature to count it joy when you fall into temptations. Uh, but, but what I'm hearing you say is that if we can live our life through this lens, that, that through this we can glorify God, through this we can become better, uh, through this we'll have a better message when we get to the end, uh, through this we can glorify God, that that's what helps us get through the temptations. Amen. Yes, and, it, and it's interesting that you know, when you, you said that about James, uh, count it all joy when you fall into those diverse temptations as you mentioned there in, in James chapter one. Um, it's when we, when we read something like that, we often think, well, maybe that's easy for someone to say, but you know, those apostles and those early disciples, they really lived that out. Um, when you consider over Acts chapter five, the apostles and those early disciples were being persecuted for preaching and teaching the gospel, um, which of course was the better way. Um, it was uh, it was intended by God for it to be now a, a new thing, a replacement for that old fulfilled law that was of course satisfied by Jesus Christ. And as they're preaching and teaching in the uh, temple, the high priest you know, gathers his family together and they come out to judge these apostles. And of course they commit them to, to jail for a night and then they bring them back out and, and they say, you know, we command you no longer to preach in the 
name of this Jesus of Nazareth and and to go on to persecute them. You know, those apostles, as it was, as they were beaten and uh, and then let go, they counted a, a joyful thing. They rejoiced over the fact that they were able to suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ. That sounds so contrary to our day and time, doesn't it? It sounds so contrary to our way of living as, as, a, as Americans and as a 21st century people, um, but yet that's how the Christian still ought to be, that we ought to rejoice, even if it is that we're suffering shame, because we're suffering for someone in some uh, a purpose that is far greater than suffering shame for anything else in this world. Anything else that we're suffering shame for, my friends, we're, you know, we're, just, we're sh- suffering shame for something less than the than the name of Christ, and that's um, perhaps maybe not worth it. But here, those apostles believed it was worth it and rejoiced over it, and that they were able to suffer shame for the, the name of Christ. So James wasn't just saying something that I believe that he was not willing to also endure for himself, uh, but he's encouraging us to think using that, that transformed mind that we have you know, where the Bible tells us that uh, we ought not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We we have a renewed mind that we ought to be transformed by and, and thinking differently and contrary um, to this. And, and as uh, Americans, uh, we sometimes get these things turned around backwards. We oftentimes think of, um, you know, our rights and privileges in this country as being so important to us, and sometimes we elevate those things to a, a status where I don't, I don't know that they're meant to be elevated, but rather we, we have to remember that this earth, America included, is not our home. You know, we, we are created uh, for a kingdom that is everlasting, um, and we have entrance to that kingdom by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and what a privilege that is. Uh, you know, we consider our privileges and rights in America, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of uh, worship, uh, in the way that we see fit, um, you know, the right to bear arms, etc. cetera. We, we think about this Bill of Rights that we have here, but the, the greatest privilege we have in, in life is the eternal life that God has given to us by his amazing grace. And so... Uh, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, we're encouraged to remember that our citizenship is in heaven. That's where our conversation is. This, uh, this kingdom that we are a part of is everlasting. And so if it's an everlasting eternal kingdom, then we ought to consider that uh, in every situation as being most important. And here's the real reason why, the greatest reason I should say why, is because God is most concerned with that kingdom. And so what God's most concerned with is what I believe we ought to be most concerned with. So is the trial we're going through something that um, that, that we should whine or complain about and say, you know, how, uh, you know, how bad it is for me, woe is me, um, I'm going to pick a fight or bicker with, with those that I love, those that I'm around, or even strangers over the internet, or am I going to use this trial to see um, what it is that, you know, that the Lord would have me to do to glorify him for the purpose uh, of, of letting my light shine, even in the midst of this situation, as you said, using those, uh, those messes in our life to, to, to glorify God, am I going to use this as an opportunity to point to the kingdom of God which is, of course, what Jesus was all concerned with as well. He said it was the Father's good pleasure to give unto us, these, this, this, us, us mortals, um, to give unto us the kingdom. And it was, if it's pleasing to him, then man, what, a, what a thing we're entrusted with. That's, uh, it, it's really an amazing thing to be able to, to say, not only are we a part of a heavenly kingdom, but also we have been given the care of such 
a kingdom while we're here in this world. Right. And so that's, that's probably something that separates us from those early disciples is that um, brother Michael Goins wrote, and I think it's his book, glory to come. This always stuck out to me that they had, they lost the pilgrim perspective. And I remember he uses the word tenacity that we as, as Christians today hold to this world with the tenacity that is no different than, than unbelievers. And, and when we start focusing so much on this world, we do lose the, that pilgrim perspective that we're just passing through. We're pilgrims and strangers scattered throughout this, this globe, uh, but we belong to a kingdom that transcends uh, nation, you know, boundaries that men have, have set up. So I, I love what you're saying there, man. Our conversation, our way of life, our citizenship is actually not here. I'm a dual citizen. I'm a citizen of America, and I'm a citizen of heaven, and heaven is my main priority. That's right. Yes, and and I I love our country. I would never want anyone to think that I, I'm I'm not a lover of the United States of America. It's it's afforded us so many blessings um, that, that truly God, or I should say, the avenue through which God has blessed us with so much, uh, you know, prosperity and safety and, and praise God for all those things. Praise God for this wonderful country we live in. That's right. Um, you know, but the the truth is is that you know, this kingdom will fail one day just as all kingdoms do and have um if it if it is that the united states is still standing when the lord jesus returns well we know what this earth is going to experience this it's going to be burned up with a fervent heat so all the elements shall be consumed when the lord jesus returns but the apostles knew as well as you know those early disciples they all knew that God's kingdom uh, could never be thwarted. It was it was never going to fail. When Jesus gives to Peter that that wonderful acknowledgement about um, who he is, you know, he says to him that I say that thou art Simon Barjona. Um, you know, flesh and blood has not revealed the knowledge that you have of me, that being the Son of God, but my Father in heaven did that, and he tells. Simon, Peter, he says to him, um, and upon the truth uh, that you have acknowledged that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I will build my church on this, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Think about this. You know, if we were to think about how America could never be destroyed, if we truly live with it, and sometimes I think we, we get to think in that way, uh, you know, how might our behavior change toward this country of ours? We might be tempted to elevate it above God's kingdom, but, but truthfully, all kingdoms shall perish. All kingdoms shall fail except one. And not even the kingdom, uh, of, of, of the devil, if you want to consider that, uh, his, you know, his, his kingdom is going to fail too. And it has, it's been, it was, destroyed at the point which Jesus Christ says it is finished upon the cross of Calvary. So what have we to fear? What did the apostles have to fear? They knew that the kingdom that they counted as being most important to them was in no way ever uh, going to be destroyed. And so uh, when we live with this heavenly mindedness uh, about our kingdom that we are part of, uh, that, that adds a, a great sense of confidence in, in our boldness uh, for God and uh, on his behalf, you know, because because truly we are here as a, as a people who are ambassadors for Christ. When we think about that, the Apostle Paul said that he was an ambassador, um, and he said even on, uh, on behalf of Christ, in Christ's stead, that they were beseeching um, the, the Corinthians. They were begging them, if you will, on Christ's death to, to be reconciled unto God. Uh, and so as ambassadors, we have to think about the, the term that he uses and how appropriate it really is for us Christians here in this world that this place is not our home, but yet the Lord has given to us um, uh, the, that, that citizenship that we have not been to that motherland yet. I love how it's described uh, that 
New Jerusalem, which is the mother of us all. We haven't been to that motherland yet, but as ambassadors for Christ's sake and in Christ's stead, um, we have a responsibility to tell other people about that heavenly home and that their citizenship is there as well. And that we have been given an embassy here in this world. It's known as the church. And we, we tell people, seek sanctuary here when this world is such a, can be such a horrible place at times. And when it can seem that the devil is just relentless upon us, we have a sanctuary. And the Lord Jesus has not left us comfortless in this world, but rather has given to us uh, the safety of a church and the family of God, where it is visible, where we can see and and, and love one another and know that, as you, as you mentioned, you know, that we are pilgrims together in this place. That, to me, is one of the greatest comforts, especially when we're going through hardships and trials. How important that embassy, the church, is for us to seek a refuge in. And, and Jesus Christ knew exactly what he was doing when he established that and then uh, taught others that they should press into that same kingdom. Well, I hope you enjoyed our conversation so far with Brother Ben. And I wanted to tell you about his own podcast, the Abundant Life Podcast. You can find that at lexpbc.org. That's lexpbc.org. That's the Lexington Primitive Baptist Church website, and I think you'll enjoy that as well. We're going to pick this conversation back up in two weeks when we release part two of our conversation. Until then, may God bless you.